Hello, everyone, and welcome to the YMCA of Greater Seattle's Suicide Prevention Webinar Learning Series, where we hear from behavioral health experts both inside and outside of the YMCA about important topics around suicide. Thank you to uh, the uh, Y Social Impact Center uh, for your work in organizing this series, as well as our partner, um, Washington Health Authority, uh, for sponsoring this. Uh, if you're just joining us for the first time, I invite you to look at the chat box for a link to our website um, where our previous webinars are located. As always, we will be recording this webinar and we'll have it available on our website as soon as possible. In addition, please check uh, our chat box where our team will be providing helpful resources and links that you can use after the webinar is over. These will also be sent out in a follow up email to all registered attendees. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to post it in the chat and our team will answer during the webinar um, or at the questions portion at the end. And uh, for those watching, please email uh, events at seattleymca.org for any resources or M as in March Burns at seattleymca.org. Finally, we wanna say thank you to everyone for joining. And if you or someone you know is experiencing a crisis, there are supports available. Please use the National Crisis Lifeline at 800-273-8255. Now, I am incredibly excited uh, to introduce uh, Charlene uh, Ray, um, our partner for tonight, who will be presenting Learn Forefronts a Suicide Crisis Prevention Training. Um, if you are watching from one of our previous webinars, you may be familiar with Charlene as she's been uh, a great partner to us, um, uh, presenting on a couple of other uh, webinars. Um, really quickly, I would like to do a small bio for uh, Charlene, um, but <laughs> having trouble uh, finding it. So um, while we, uh, uh, while I have some technical difficulties, um, I would actually uh, invite Charlene, if you could, uh, if you would be able to, uh, maybe speak a little bit to Forefront's work, um, if you're able to. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm very happy to be here with you for this Forefront um, Suicide Prevention Learn Saves Lives uh, webinar. If you go to the next slide, you will see our mission statement, and I can speak to Forefront. Um, Forefront is a center of excellence at the University of Washington, where the focus is on reducing suicide by empowering individuals and communities to take sustainable action and champion systemic change and restoring hope. So I am happy to introduce myself, uh, David, which is just fine. Um, you do a lovely job with my bio, but I can let everyone know um, that I have an MSW, I'm an LICSW, and I am um, a Forefront trainer and Forefront in the Schools coach. I have a private practice and I also work in the schools in suicide prevention and um, do some grief work um, in my private practice. That's one of my primary focuses and uh, very happy to be here with you this evening. So we'll go to the next slide. So this is a, a training that covers a topic that can be emotionally challenging. So I really wanna remind you about a few things as we move into the talk that um, to take good care of yourself is really important. So during this webinar, if you feel like you need a break, um, please um, get up and stretch, get yourself a glass of water, step out of the room for a few for a few moments. It will be recorded so you can listen in um, later. But if you're if you're able to stay with us, um, please avoid multitasking if you can, because it's really um, helpful if you're if you're fully present for this really important material. And there will be some things that we'd like you to practice later be able to use these skills. It takes practice, uh, patience and practice make progress. And also helpful to talk to someone you trust about this training and your experience today, especially if something um, comes up for you. And you're welcome to use the, um, the chat for putting in your questions, your comments, 
and I may ask a question or two um, throughout the webinar and would love to hear um, from all of you who are here to today or tonight, uh, wherever you are in whatever time zone. So please do take care of yourself. So just for a moment to think about what, what's your intention for coming to this training? What brings you here today? And some of you may have experienced um, suicidal thoughts yourself or someone in your family or someone you know. You may have um, lost someone to suicide. You may just be curious. You may work for an organization that has um, some suicide prevention as part of their work. Lots of different reasons that might bring you here. And you can feel free if you'd like to put in the chat um, and David will have a look at that while I'm giving the webinar and we can check in about it um, at some point to see who's here with us um, today. And I'm happy to um, happy to answer any questions you has, have, as I said, at the end. But let's talk about our training objectives for our time together. We have three of them. We're going to start by giving you an idea of suicide, uh, the impact of suicide, and understand why people may die by suicide. And then the heart of our webinar will be learning the suicide prevention skills that you can use. And then we'll talk about how to integrate what we've learned into your personal and professional life. And so after this training, um, we hope that you will use what you learn to reach out to someone in distress. We, will, we hope that you'll begin to say died by suicide, and I'll talk about that a little bit more um, soon. That you will add some 24-hour crisis resources into your phone, either for yourself or for others. And that you will take some steps to make your own home safer to help prevent suicide. So let's start with training objective one. We're going to cover some basic statistics about the impact of suicide and talk a bit more about why people consider and die by suicide. So we'll start with debunking some common myths. We'll talk about a few of these. So let's bring up the first one here. Suicide affects all communities. And this is true. People of all backgrounds can be at risk for suicide no matter race, socioeconomic status, gender, or sexuality. It is true that some groups are at higher risk than the general public. This includes um, veterans, the LGBTQ plus community, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, just to name a few. But there is, you know, there's a myth that only certain people are affected by suicide, and that's not true. We know that it affects all communities. And the next one, many suicides are preventable. Some people think that, um, that no matter what, we can't really prevent suicide. If someone wants to die by suicide, they will just do that. But we do know, and research has shown, that at, the more we learn how to recognize signs of suicide and learn how to assist and support others, the more we can help prevent suicide. And the next one, asking about suicide doesn't cause suicide. This is a really important one to debunk because many people have this um, thought in their head that if I ask, you know, aren't I going to put that idea in their head? And we know that this is just not true. Research shows that asking compassionately if someone is thinking about suicide can actually lower the risk. And the final one that we'll talk about um, now is that suicide results from multiple complex factors. Many people think that, um, or maybe hear about one thing that was maybe the last thing that happened before a person took their takes their own life. And we think, well, that's the thing. But when we look a little closer, we can see that virtually all suicides are due to multiple factors, sometimes going back many years. So let's take a look at some statistics. <clears throat> Excuse me, and these may be startling 
to you. Maybe they're as startling to you as they were to me when I first saw them, even though I work in the field. To see the number, you know, over 48,000 lives lost to suicide in 2018 is just, you know, it's, it's a heartbreaking number of people. And then we see that suicide's the 10th leading cause of death and um, that whites, American Indians, and Alaskan Natives have the highest rates of suicide. And then if we talk about attempts, look at that number, 1.2 million suicide attempts in 2018. So that's, you know, that's a mind-blowing number, I think, um, if we think about that. And we do know there's some um, gender differences that 3.6 male deaths by suicide for every one female death. And that's because um, males tend to choose more lethal methods. And three female attempts um, for every one by males. And that's um, because women tend to attempt more and use less lethal methods. And then another statistic that can be quite shocking is to think that for every suicide, approximately 147 people are affected. So we think about the people closest to that person. Then we talk about family, close friends, people in the community, people they might have worked with. And you can begin to get the idea that this is a lot of people that have been touched by suicide. And it becomes very clear um, that this is a public health crisis. So let's look at the next slide, which is the Healthy Youth Survey. So just another perspective on statistics. Some of you may be familiar with the fact that at least um, in Washington state, you, youth are given a Healthy Youth Survey every two years or so, and they're given that survey in eighth, 10th, and 12th grade. And some of the questions are related to suicide. And as you can see here, it's pretty, um, pretty consistent across the grades that around 20 to 23% um, of youth who, who reported on this survey have considered suicide. And around 16 to 18% make, made a plan. And we have around nine or 10% attempting. Another, you know, really, startling statistics and really makes sense why we want to do work with, you know, with youth and Forefront has a Forefront in the Schools program where we help schools with their suicide prevention. And we're doing that out in the community with um, organizations like the Y because we really want to impact these numbers. So let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit now about why do people die by suicide? So he, this is a theory, an um, adaptation from a theory by Thomas Joyner, who's the suicidologist. And this is from his interpersonal theory of suicide. And I think it's a really good way of understanding what happens in a person's mind that may bring them to this point of choosing to take their own life. So let's look at these three circles you see there. Thwarted belongingness. So this is kind of a academic way of saying that a person feels like they don't belong in their community, their family, their identity. One way you might think about this is um, veterans, you know, veterans who have a high rate of suicide, you know, when they're with their military family, they feel very connected often and feel like they belong and then can have some challenges coming back into civilian life and trying to find their place and, and where they belong. So that's just, that's just one example. And then we also have um, this circle called perceived burdensomeness. And that's exactly what it sounds like. You think you're a burden to those you care about. And you might think about um, perhaps someone who has, their job and they provide for the family and if they lose their job and they can't um, provide for the family anymore, they may feel like they're more of a burden than a support to their family. Again, just one example of many ways in which someone might feel that way. And what happens when we 
we have these two things coming together with an acquired capability is where we have a lot of risk for suicide. And what acquired capability is, is when our strong desire to survive and live is impacted by the pain that we're experiencing to the point where a person becomes less fearful of death and more able to act to end their own life. And then if a person has access, easy access to lethal means at that time, and they're comfortable using those means, they may have acquired the capability for their own death. So you see when those three things come together, we have that, that zone in the center there, which um, can be really where the high, high risk comes in. Now there's some things, if we, if we animate this, we'll see there's some things that impact these circles in the center. And one is called risk and protected factors. So risk factors are like things about a person's life that we usually can't change because perhaps they happened in the past or they were beyond a person's control. You know, and that can include things like um, adverse childhood experiences. Um, it can include um, growing up, you know, and, and having abuse history, it can include um, historical trauma, um, things like racism and discrimination, can be mental illness, alcohol use and misuse, all those kinds of things are can be considered risk factors. And then we also have protective factors, which are supportive things that help a person feel like they belong and have purpose, and that can be connected to a cultural, um, background that provides a sense of protective um, safety. It could be a uh, religious affiliation that provides that. Um, many things can be the protective factors. And so you could see that risk factors would put a lot of, the more risk factors can put a lot of pressure on those circles and make a person feel those things even more intensely. And protective factors can relieve that so that a person feels like there's support and there's hope. And the same is true with experiences. There can be positive and negative experiences that impact that sense of belonging or burdensomeness. And those, you know, so experiences can be really good things um, that happen to, to a person like a positive relationship or getting a really good job or, you know, having a strong community. And the other experiences could be things like COVID, right? All of the loss and grief associated with COVID that could be a net, that is the negative experience. So it gives you just a little bit of an idea of um, why people might die by suicide, what's going on with them, what they might be feeling. And the next slide talks about that a little bit more too. And really here we wanna stress that suicide is not about wanting to die forever. It's about wanting to end terrible pain. We need to remember that suicidal thoughts are not rational. They're like being in a dark tunnel and they're the result of psychological and often physical exhaustion. And this is one reason why suicidal individuals have a difficult time reaching out for help. They don't think they're worth the help. They don't think anything will help and they're too exhausted to make the effort. So they need someone who cares about them, someone like us who can come alongside them and help them find the support. Our next slide, please. So language matters. One of the things we can start doing today is instead of saying committed suicide, let's say died by suicide or took their own life. And if you think about that, why should we stop using the word committed? What's probably coming to your mind is that the word committed associates suicide with being a crime or a sin. And we wanna remove judgment from anything to do with mental health to reduce the stigma. This language is also hurtful for those who've lost a loved one to suicide. So we can make a change by changing our language, by calling it what it is and saying died by suicide or took their own life. 
it will take time. You have to catch yourself, um, you know, and just correct yourself gently. But this is something we can work on today. So let's move into um, training objective two, where we will talk about the learn skills. So let's look at the next slide where we have the acronym spelled out for you so you can see what it stands for. Look for signs, empathize and listen, ask about suicide, reduce the danger and next steps. So we're gonna go through these one by one, starting in the next slide with the L step. This stands for look for signs. And remember what I, what I said about um, multiple factors, right? There's also, so thinking about the multiple signs and what we need to do is be trained to look for them. Most of us are not trained to do that and, and then to know what to do about them. And that's the skills we're gonna give you um, today. So in the next slide, we're gonna look at some of those warning signs. So we talk about them in three categories, emotions and feelings, actions and behaviors, and experiences. So just reflect, I won't ask you for examples, just for reflect for a moment though, and think in your mind, what do you know already to be true about warning signs? What would you think of if we, uh, what emotions or actions or experiences might be a warning sign for suicide? And let's see what, see if you come up with what we have here on the slide. Let's start with emotions and feelings. So here are a variety of emotions that um, could be warning signs, depression, anxiety, anger and irritation, emptiness, loneliness, hopelessness, helplessness, shame, humiliation, and pain. Sometimes you will see these emotions very visible and sometimes you might need to ask about them or you know they might a person might be quieter about this one of the things you're looking for is a change in the individual's personality some of the, the these emotions and actions and experiences will have increased or suddenly appeared or maybe they are related to something that you know has happened to them that's very significant so, but we're looking for a change Let's look at actions and behaviors. What might we see that could be warning signs? Very commonly, people mention withdrawing and isolating. People are familiar with that, um, that people stop participating in things that they used to enjoy. There may be increased drug and alcohol use. We also need to remember that the effects of alcohol lower um, a person's inhibition and increase Im impulsivity and also increase depression and negative feelings. A person may be researching ways to die, have trouble sleeping or sleeping too much, may be giving away possessions or pets. They may be engaging in some reckless behavior that's unusual for them or an increase in that kind of behavior. They may be joking, threatening, or making statements about death. And I see this uh, with youth quite often, and we really want to make sure we let them know, uh, let a person know that we're going to take that seriously and that we're going to clarify the meaning behind a comment if we're not, if it's not clear. And then also threats against self or others and self that um, includes self harm. And in one thing about self harm to remember is that not everyone who harms themselves and cuts is at risk for suicide. Some people who self-harm do so to alleviate acute emotional distress without, with no intent to die. So we just wanna think about it. Obviously, if someone is harming themselves, it's something that we want to um, talk to them about and provide some support around. And then experiences, let's talk about those. So if there's been a recent loss to suicide, that increases a person's risk loss of employment, a breakup, divorce, or other relationship difficulties, transitions. We already talked about the one um, of veterans, you know, coming back to civilian life that we can also think about 
like a transition from high school to life after high school can be very difficult for some young people. Discrimination linked to sexual orientation and or gender identity. Um, personal trauma we mentioned as a risk factor, um, but is also could be a warning sign if we become aware of either recent or past personal trauma. And then historical trauma, which is important to remember includes colonization, genocide, and mass trauma among entire populations of people. Uh, many American Indian tribes, you know, have been subject to historical trauma. So it's good to, and racism, so many different experiences that people have had where they have been marginalized and oppressed can be a risk factor. And then involvement in just in the justice system and incarceration, incarceration and those people who um, are recently released can be at high risk of suicide. One comment I want to make here that usually comes up in the training if we were able to have a discussion about this right now is that there's an em emotion that people sometimes feel, which is like a sudden happiness or euphoria after feeling depressed for quite a while. And we want to be aware of that because that can come from a person knowing that they have a plan or a way out, a way to end their pain. So that's something we definitely want to include in our warning signs if we see that. Let's move on to the next step. So now we're on to the E step, and this is about empathy and active listening. And, you know, often our instinct is to fix someone's problem. And we want to um, talk here about building connection with a person by listening to, to them. So we're going to watch a video um, from Brene Brown. You may have seen this before, but um, if not, it's a it's a great video that tells us the difference between empathy and sympathy and maybe how to respond to someone. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is... Ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. 
what makes something better is connection. Let me go to the next slide. There we go. So great video, isn't it? It's um, it's so good, and I um, I love how she talks about empathy as sacred space, really being with someone in that sacred space. So let's um, look at which of these is an example of empathy, and let's put them all put them all up, and you can see what you think. Offering to fix the problem asking why questions, offering our own perspective, and mostly listening. So you probably can see really quickly um, that mostly listening is the answer that we're looking for here. Um, some of those other things might have their place at some time, but when we're looking for empathy, we're looking for listening. And let's look at that a little bit more in this next slide where we talk a bit more about Teresa Wiseman's um, components of empathy. And this is something that Brene Brown mentioned in the video where she talks about um, if we're going to show empathy, we really want to try to see the world as others see it and be non-judgmental, validate their feelings, communicate that we understand. So we're basically really reflecting back what they've shared doing our best to avoid judgment and stay, you know, calm and neutral. So it's not about, it's not the time for cheering someone up, right? That's what we think of sometimes when someone's in a painful place. But what helps a person more is having someone see their pain. You, you don't need to agree with their feelings. You don't need to fully understand why they're feeling what they do, but you need to understand how they feel and share that back with them so they feel less alone and feel that connection. It's like going down the ladder to meet the person, just like in the video. And when you meet them, you might wonder, what do I say to them? In the video, um, Brene Brown said at the end, you know, I don't know what to say, but I'm so glad you told me. With such, with, which is a wonderful thing to say. And here are some more examples. These are some from the Forefront staff. We asked them for some phrases that they heard and thought were helpful. And so here are some examples. So you could say something like, you must really be hurting, or I'm here to help, or I'm humbled you would share that with me. Do you wanna talk about it? And for some people in your life, I love you no matter what could be the most helpful thing to say. It's going to depend on the relationship and and your role in that person's life. But those are some helpful things to say to show empathy. So let's move on to the A step. So you've probably heard the saying, if you see something, say something. Most of us are familiar with that. If we're supposed to say something, potentially do something about it and our sort of if we if we hear something, if we've been observing some warning signs and we've been listening to a person and we are concerned, we want to say something. And that saying something in this case is asking about suicide. Most people will be honest if asked about suicide in a direct and compassionate way. Many people have been having those thoughts for a very long time and you know have never felt comfortable sharing it. And when asked, they often feel relieved that they that you're willing to talk with them about it. So how do we ask about suicide? I've also already mentioned the word being direct. So we want to be courageous and direct. We want to try to be as calm as we possibly can so we can ask in a more matter of fact tone. And we want to avoid vague language, right? So you know, here's a couple ways. Are you thinking about suicide? Are you thinking about killing yourself? If you're not comfortable with the word suicide, you might want to say, are you thinking about killing yourself? And you might think to yourself for a moment, why is it important to ask directly about suicide? So it demonstrates to a person that you're comfortable with a big, scary topic. 
and it increases the chances that a person will answer you honestly. And you give a person who's been holding a lot of pain inside a chance to share it with you, which is so important. And we want to avoid the vague language. And you might think about some examples of what would vague language be? It could be something like, are you thinking about doing something stupid? Or you're not thinking about doing something stupid, are you? Some people put it that way. And that doesn't give us enough information, right? So we do need to ask um, directly about what about suicide. And how do we do that? So we have a framework that I think works really well um, for asking about suicide. And this is what uh, what I use with clients and other people who I've asked who I ask about suicide. And it's one that we teach. Um, we teach many people how to use, whether when we work in schools, we're teaching educators, we're teaching um, students how to use this framework with each other, parents, and this is something that you can use with all the people in your life. And we ask simply by um, using this formula, sometimes when people are in those blank lines there, what we insert are the things that we have been observing or listening to the, when we're listening to the person, we've been listening to some things that they've been talking about. And we say those, we, we say what we have noticed and what we've heard so that the person knows that we've been listening, that this question isn't coming out of no, nowhere, right? We've been paying attention. And so it might go something like, sometimes when people are feeling alone, and isolating from friends and tired, you know, tired and feeling like giving up on life. They're thinking about suicide. Are you thinking about suicide? So you would put in there whatever you're noticing, whatever warning signs the person has. And the reason, you know, we also use, you might notice people and they, those are really important words in this framework because it helps to normalize talking about suicide. And people often, you know, when you use this framework, they'll say, oh, other people think about this. Because when we, when we use those words, that's what, they, that's what they hear and that's what they get, that I'm not alone. I'm not the only person who's felt this way. When we, and when we can feel that um, common humanity that other people might feel this way, it can be really helpful for that feeling of I don't, you know, I don't belong. I don't, you know, I'm fit. I don't fit in anywhere. Someone can suddenly feel like, you know, it's it's OK. I'm OK. You know that these are these are bad feelings. This is the pain that I'm feeling and someone's willing to listen to it. So I think it can be a very powerful way to ask about suicide. So then you might ask, when do you ask? Right, that's one of the next questions. And we talked a little bit about when we see multiple signs, when we see big changes in a person's life or behavior, and when your gut tells you to. If something in you is concerned and something's not lining up and you, you're just, it doesn't feel right, <clears throat> just ask. There's never harm in asking about suicide because someone might, they'll just say no if they're not thinking about it. So what do we do if they say no? That's our next slide. So we definitely want to let the person know we care. We cared enough to ask, right? So we want to keep the lines of communication open, using our empathy skills, listening, staying connected. And if you're still concerned about their safety, you might talk a little bit more, gather some more information, and then ask again. If they still say no, a really good question to ask is if you were thinking about suicide, who would you talk to? This is such an important question because it helps you know if they have someone to talk to in their life. It also helps them start to think about who is my support. And if they say, I don't have anyone to talk to, you might say, well, you can talk to me. I am here for you. There's another place where you can show your empathy. 
And obviously you do some other things as you move on to the R and the N steps, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. And what if they say yes? So we really want to take it seriously. We want to thank them for being honest with us and we want to acknowledge the pain that they're in. Those are the first things we do. There's a lot more to do because we want to help keep them safe and we want to get them some support. And that's what happens when we move on to the R and the N steps, which we will do now. So I know this is a lot of information, so feel free again if you have questions to um, to put them in the chat and we'll we'll spend some time at the end on those. But in the R step, we're taking some practical action to keep someone safe. This stands for reduce the danger and it, it, it means removing the person's access to things that they could use to end their life. And I've been using the term lethal means and that's what I mean by that, things that someone could use to end their life. Lethal means are not always in the picture um, if someone hasn't um, formed a plan yet, they have some thoughts but don't have a plan, they will be at lower risk than someone else, right? But we um, we want to take some steps to help reduce the danger for people, and that depends on our role. Um, and you know, is this a friend? Is this a family member? Is this um, is this a colleague? Let's uh, look at the next slide so we can see some some things that are relate to our role in reducing danger. So for some people, your role may be to interrupt the plan. You know, if it's someone very close to you, if it's um, someone who lives in your own house, um, that may be the role that you have. It could be that your role is to identify allies and support people who can help. All of us have the role, it's all a part of our role to demonstrate care and empathy to the individual and we can all play a part in proactively reducing danger in our own home and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So the next slide. But if someone has said yes that they are thinking about suicide then we need to ask these questions. These are the, the follow-up questions that we must ask if someone says yes and if you don't feel comfortable asking them, then your your role may be to bring the person to someone who does feel comfortable asking because we need to know the level of risk. So these questions, have you thought about how you might end your life? Do you have access to those methods? And have you thought about when you might do this? Give us gives us an idea of risk, right? Very different if someone says, well, no, I haven't really thought about how I'm going to end my life. I just think about it sometimes. That's a very different risk level than if someone says, yes, I have thought about it very much and I have a lot of medication, you know, in my bathroom. And even and they may even say, and you know, I don't know when I might use it or they might say I might take it this weekend. And you can see the different level of risk with those different situations. And it's really important to remember that putting time and distance between the suicidal person and the methods that they may use can save their life. This, I also want to acknowledge that these are not easy conversations and you may, you may have to show so, a fair amount of compassion and care for yourself and having these conversations because it can be difficult and even scary and it may be difficult to understand how much pain this person is in. So tending to yourself is very important so you can stay as calm as you possibly can and get some help and support if for yourself in asking these questions and certainly afterwards um, if it's um, really difficult for you. And then we'll go to the next slide and talk a little bit about some of the lethal means. We're going to talk about a couple of them. This one, very important. We talk about firearms because approximately 50% of all suicides in the United States involve a firearm. So we know that putting a practical barrier 
between a suicidal person and their firearms can interrupt the path to suicide. It's one of the most important things you can do to prevent suicide is to lock and limit access to firearms. So what we talk about is all firearms, including those used for home defense, being locked up. And then if we're concerned about a person, we might um, want to see if we can get them to give a trusted individual keys and combinations to the locking devices. Youth should not have unsupervised access to firearms. We also may identify a friend or relative who could hold the firearms uh, in with an emergency temporary transfer. Important to remember that the person who owns the firearm has to um, be willing to do that. So if these strategies don't work, you can also activate an extreme risk protection order, but we try to have these, you know, work with these other strategies um, before we do that. And we try to just universally as a prevention, get as many firearms locked up. So then when there is a crisis, there's less concern because they are locked. So in the next slide, we'll talk about medications. And medications are the leading method used in suicide attempts. And it isn't just prescription medications. This is really important because a lot of people don't um, realize this, that it's prescription and over-the-counter medications. You know, we think about opioids and things like that being used as um, in a suicide attempt, but the Washington Poison Center reports that the number one substance they saw in suspected suicides was ibuprofen. And if we think about that, most of us have ibuprofen in our homes and a good amount of it is probably unlocked and we buy it in large quantities too. So it's important to realize that that is dangerous in a large quantity and we wanna lock up anything beyond a one week supply and maybe even a one day dose if there's a mental health crisis. I know that in my own, you know, with my own clients, many of the younger uh, youth that I've worked with who have made suicide attempts over the past year or so um, have used ibuprofen. So it's really important. Um, I talk with a lot of families about locking up those medications. So we can all do that and we can all remove expired and excess medications from our home. And at least in Washington state, there are drug disposal sites listed on takebackyourmeds.org. And I'm not sure about other states. I know sometimes we have people from other places listening and I'm sure there are an equivalent where you live. So I would just look that up online as a place where you can get rid of expired and excess medications. So in the next slide, just to review, we want to lock up today firearms, prescription medications, and over-the-counter medications. And then in a crisis, we're going to lock up a variety of other things, depending sometimes on the level of risk, depending on what the person has told us about um, what means they would want to use. And, you know, and if we sometimes if someone's in a very um, difficult place, we're really going through the house and locking up anything that we think they could harm themselves with or take their life with. So on to the end step. So this is this is the next steps and this is the last step in the in the learn and it's about connecting a person in crisis to resources that can help. So again we're going to talk about your role. So on the next slide it's next steps depend on your role. So you think about um, what that might be. Your role might be to connect the person to a suicide prevention lifeline or crisis text line. It could be to, you know, bring together other support, family members, friends, peers, other people that are supportive. It could be um, connecting with resources available on a campus and an organization. Um, primary care providers, mental health providers, it may be bringing other people like that in to support the person. Um, sometimes we are um, getting trusted others or family members or caregivers to help with removing danger 
and ensuring support. And then we always want to continue to check in with the person, right? To just later that day after we've um, maybe they've gone with someone else now, another trusted person, support person, or they've gone to get some get some help. We want to check back in later that day, the next day, and do some ongoing checking in um, because we've built that empathic connection and we really want to um, let them know that we really meant it. We're really here for them and that we're going to check in. And then if we go to our next slide, you will see some resources that could be helpful to you. So there's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which also has services for veterans and services in Spanish. Um, the Crisis Text Line, um, in Washington State, we text HEAL to 741741. Those words are based on geographic location, but I am um, I have heard that you could pretty much text anything to that number and they will respond. Um, and the youth like to use, um, the youth I work with like to use the crisis text line. And then there are also the trans lifeline, and which also has Spanish services and the Trevor Project, which also has a text line. There are many other lifelines. It's very good to know the the one that's um, your local crisis line. So if that's something you don't have in your phone, I suggest that you look that up and put that in your phone as well. Um, and also um, there are some that are specific to different issues like um, sexual assault or domestic violence, eating disorders, addiction, and you can find those online if you just Google any one of those concerns. There are some veteran specific um, websites that are really helpful. Um, and so I just suggest that you you Google that if you if you want some more information. We also um, have included here a couple websites where you can, there's four of them there where you can find ongoing counseling support. It's also very good if you to maybe know if you, especially if you work in this field, to know who are the counselors in my community who work with um, adults and youth and children. And particularly if they're um, if they're suicidal, who can help, who can support. And I keep these, you know, I keep these in my phone because I, well, I'm a therapist, so I use these numbers probably more often than you might. But I also think that it's helpful because you never know when you might need them. And you might need them yourself at some point. And so it's good to have access to them. So we're going to move into um, training objective three. I know we have been moving very quickly. I want to make sure we have plenty of time at the end for questions, um, but um, we're going to talk about how to integrate these prevention approaches now. And remember too, the more times you go over this, um, this information, so it, you will um, be able to integrate that more in, and hopefully you won't have a lot of times to practice it with people that you're really concerned about, but it's like CPR, right? It's like something that we, that we want to know in case we need to use it and we hope we don't have to use it, right? So I think these learned skills are kind of like that. So I hope you will um, you will practice them, go over them so they're in your, in your mind um, in case you need them. So in this, in this um, objective, what we're going to do next is we're going to look at uh, video of two people and this features someone who considered suicide while grieving for their child who died by suicide. And we're gonna take a look at the steps in action. And so I'd like you to pay attention as you watch this video for the, the looking for signs, look for the warning signs. Where was empathy shown? How was that shown in the video? How did, um, how did they ask about suicide? What did they do to reduce the danger? And what were the next steps that they took? And we'll kind of talk about it again after the video, just to reinforce that. So I think we're ready for that. Um, Hi, come on in. Hi, Mom. 
Marnie. How are you? I'm okay. It's very good to see you. I'm sorry to show up unannounced. Oh, you're fine. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Can I get you some coffee? Coffee sounds very good. Thank you. I sent you a couple of Facebook messages and made a couple phone calls to you. Didn't hear back from you. I just wanted to check in with you and see how everything's going. Well, you know me. Thank you. I don't do Facebook, and I, I just have a lot going on. I, I'm fine. Do you want to have a seat? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Marnie, I heard last week at work in your team meeting you had a bit of a meltdown. Yeah, well... Marnie, would you come have a seat with me? Sure. Marnie, how are you? You know, sometimes I just have so much pain still. I just, I feel so terrible that as Sam's mom, I didn't know enough to keep him alive. It sounds like you're in a lot of pain. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, I mean, he struggled with depression and I, I remember telling him he was gonna grow out of it. I, I just feel, you know, all the things I could have done and I didn't do to help him. How are you sleeping? Uh, I have this sort of half sleep in which I just play memories, oh, you know, half the night. Uh, right. You know, Marnie, sometimes when people aren't sleeping well, are having meltdowns at work, are missing weekend events with friends, and are suicide loss survivors themselves, they're thinking about suicide. Marnie, are you thinking about suicide? <sighs> David, sometimes I do. He was my only child. Right. Thank you for your honest response. Have you thought about how you might take your own life? I have all of Sam's meds still. And those meds are here in the house? Upstairs. How about we go upstairs and get those medications rounded up? Uh, you know, I don't really want to let go of them, honestly. Okay. Nor do I want to take them, but how about I just hold them for now? Well, it's not like I'm going to take them today. Marnie, I'm not leaving this house today without those medications. And how about you? Let's get you some help. I'm calling the Suicide Lifeline. I'm putting this on speakerphone. You have reached the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, also serving the Veterans Crisis Line.
OK. Well, let's just take a moment to um, appreciate Marnie and David for that video that they were willing to do. And um, I've seen that video many times and it's always um, very moving and touching. And I'm sure many of you felt that way, but it is also a gift to us to be able to learn more about this, um, these skills by seeing them in action in that um, video. So let's go one by one through the learn and, and just review what we saw. So the first thing was what warning signs were concerning. So you probably saw that um, Marnie wasn't responding to messages, right? And meltdown at work, a suicide loss survivor herself, not sleeping well, missing some events with friends. Um, so you you heard a number of warning signs that were concerning in, in that video. And then the next step, so the empathy. What, how was empathy displayed in the video? If you think for a minute about how David was with Marnie about saying things like come have a seat you know so they could be down at the same level he could have eye contact looking at her and asking you know marnie how are you and being very present i uh, hopefully you noticed how present and calm he remained and and he was right there with with her and then the ask is the a step how did they ask directly about suicide so hopefully you notice the framework that David used the framework, mentioning the things that um, that he'd asked about, that he had heard about, that he observed, that she had talked about um, while he gave that framework and then thanking her for her honesty. And then he moved right into the R step, which you probably saw. How did he address removing and reducing danger? So first he had to ask to see if there if that was um, the level of risk, right? Asking, have you thought about how you might take your life? And then when she talked about the medications upstairs, you probably saw that, you know, he first it was pretty, you know, a little bit relaxed, right? H how about we go up and get them, you know, and then there was that um, not wanting to let go of them. Right, and an understanding of that. Again, continuing to show empathy throughout the conversation. You know, nor do I want to take them, he says, right? But how about I just hold them? So another step. And then still a little bit of resistance, right? Because I'm not like I'm going to do anything today, right? And so he got increasingly firmer until he really said, you know, because he's feeling very clearly, I'm not comfortable leaving this house without the meds. So he says that I'm not leaving without them. And um, so then we move into the to the end, the next steps. So the next steps were going to be, we know, going to get those medications and he was going to leave with those. But also then you you noted that how about you? Let's get you some help. And so he called the um, suicide lifeline with her present, still showing empathy all the way through, right up to the holding her hand, right? While they made the call and waited for the person to answer on the other end. So you see all those steps of the learn interaction. Great, so let's go to the next. Step. So, a really important thing to remember is that if a person is willing to join you in this conversation, you will have witnessed great courage and trust. It takes tremendous courage to have a conversation about suicide. This um, really is some, it really requires our warm acknowledgement, right, of them being, staying gentle and warm and compassionate with ourselves and with the person we're with. And you really want to give yourself a badge of courage as well for being willing to have the conversation with them, for asking. 
And I always say you get a badge of courage just for being here for this training, that you're willing to learn the skills that may possibly save someone's life. That is a courageous and um, powerful thing to do as well. So let's look at um, what can we do today? So we hope that you will use what you've learned to reach out to someone in distress. We hope that you will begin to say died by suicide, that you will add some of those resources, those 24 hour resources into your phone so you have them available to you and others, and that you will take some steps to make your own home safer to help prevent suicide by locking up medications and firearms. And I know we're going to have plenty of time for questions, which I love because that's um, always wonderful if you have any questions. I think in the next slide, um, we have a feedback and evaluation form that um, we would love for you to get. We'd love to get your thoughts on this training and get your feedback so that we can continue to improve our training so that they are high quality and that you feel like you leave with the skills that you need. Um, and so we would love for you to, um, I think that link is going to go in your chat so that you can click on the red cap link to do that evaluation. And then um, we'll go to our final slide, which gives you the, the thank you. And this is the place where we're going to um, from here move into questions in just a minute. I just want to remind you that many suicides are indeed preventable and you have the tools that you can use to help um, and that you have the ability to make a difference in someone's life by your presence, by your willingness to be connected to someone and ask about, um, ask about suicide. And I really wanna thank you for your kind attention to all this information in such a short time. And that if you're struggling to say to you that you're not alone and I hope that you will use some of the resources um, to get some support. And now I'm happy to um, turn this to David so we can have our, our question and answer time. Yeah, thank you, Charlene. That, I mean, we are always so lucky to, to have you present and join us and, and everything. Um, we actually do have one question uh, right out of the gate um, that I'd like to um, pose to you. Um, is suicide a domino effect? Um, and I'm wondering about the, because I can take a lot of, me there's a lot of different ways I can go with the meaning of that question. And I'm yeah. wondering if that, if the person means that if, if one person dies by suicide, does that mean others in the community might I or? I think that that's exactly the, uh, yeah. the question. Just if if someone uh, does die by suicide, does that maybe start a chain of events of other suicides? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's what I uh, thought that um, they meant. And you know, I would say that that is something we need to be aware of and um, on alert for because sometimes it does. There can be. Um, a suicide cluster that can happen in a community or in a school. And we so we really want to um, pay attention uh, when there's a suicide. We sometimes look at, especially in schools where I work a lot, we want to talk right away to close friends and um, people that knew the person just because they're going to be at higher risk. We might want to talk with people that we know already have risk factors and now someone perhaps has shown them a way out. And so we want to be, be on alert to provide support for those people. It is, so I do think it is something that we should pay attention to, need to pay attention to. It doesn't always go that way. You know, sometimes there is often, there's just a single suicide and not others, but there are often many people who may have suicidal thoughts or, um, are in enough distress, even if not suicidal, but are in enough distress because of the suicide that we want to provide a lot of support. There's um, in schools, we have something called post 
prevention, and which is a way we provide support to schools that does include trying to prevent further suicides from happening. And we can do that, communities do that as well. I have also been a part of postvention teams for um, other organizations and communities. Wow, thank you. And it sounds like you answered this uh, additional question um, just by uh, answering that first one. Um, but maybe you might have a little bit of extra information that you'd be willing to share with us. Um, is suicide really preventable? Yes, this is something that um, I think a lot of people have different thoughts about, right? Because um, I can say that suicide is preventable sometimes, maybe quite a bit of the time from my own experience, um, you know, of talking with people and reading some of the, the research and doing this work for so long. Um, but I, you know, I know it's not always preventable and there will be there will be suicides that happen um, even sometimes after our best efforts after many years of attempting to provide support and care for someone i have certainly known families where suicide has still happened even after all of that and um you know, so I, I say that we can we can do our best and we can prevent many suicides by using these learned skills um, and really providing support to individuals. But I won't say that it's preventable all the time, but I know that it is quite a bit of the time. It's enough. It's worth it. It's worth it to, to try these skills and to reach out to someone. Wow, thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, we always have to make sure that we do whatever we can. And and yeah, I appreciate your answer. Um, Trudy S asks, um, pain as a warning sign, is that emotional pain or actual physical pain? And I believe that was in reference to um, a slide pretty early on in your presentation. Yes. And I, I would say um, that's both, right? I think on that, in that particular slide, they were referring to emotional pain, but I also feel that um, physical, chronic illness is, can be, a, you know, can be a risk factor. It can be so hard to live with, right? To have the pain from chronic illness or injury or, you know, so many different um, ways the pain can show up in our lives. And all of it can be can be a risk factor, especially if a person gets to a place where they're feeling like a, they're a burden to others who have to care for them in their pain or a burden to themselves in their own body, you know, feeling like it's a burden. Um, it can really be very difficult. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, pain is um real and and can really devastate or um, prevent somebody from feeling hopeful um, and oftentimes leading to despair and other things so thank you very much for your answer um, an anonymous um, attendee asks if i call the suicide hotline will the person i call for be arrested given the way uh, people of color and lgbtq plus folks have been treated by police I don't want to put a person in crisis in even more danger. How do I avoid the police being called on someone in crisis? Yeah, this one is a tough one on on a number of levels here because we're talking about a couple different things here. So if you call, so now I'm hearing that you're going to call the lifeline on behalf of someone else. Um, that's what it sounded like in this question. And so you're going to call. I mean, I think that if I were going to call the lifeline on behalf of someone else, I would be calling really kind of about consulting to how to get some help for them. Are there any resources available that are any ways I can reach out to this person and suggest, you know, that 
get some suggestions and support, which is a really good use of the suicide lifeline, I might add, that if you don't know what to do about someone you're concerned about, um, that is definitely something you can do, is get some support for there, um, which is different than calling the police. Now, sometimes when a person calls the lifeline, you know, if the someone on, on the end of the, the other end is very concerned about the person at imminent risk of taking their life, I mean, it's pretty high level of concern. Um, they might access law enforcement to, to go do a welfare check to make sure this person um, is not in the process of taking their life. I mean, it would have to be at that, it usually has to be at that level where they think that they're actually in, in process of, of taking their life. Um, I wouldn't, you know, so that's like calling the lifeline. I, if I were concerned about someone um, who is suicidal, I, you know, calling the police is really a last resort, I feel like, because I don't feel like that's what, um, you know, unless you know the police department near you has a social worker who could respond and um, has some, you know, knowledge of mental health crisis, I would probably try to get the person to the emergency room for immediate support and probably try to take them there instead of the police. And it's a very real concern that you bring up, another part of this whole question here, a very real concern for people of color and um, people in the LGBTQ plus community and other marginalized communities who have a lot of fear of the police. Um, and we don't want to, you know, we don't want to cause any more problems in the situation, right? So I think that there are some, there's some other things we can do to try to avoid um, law enforcement being involved. Unless, you know, I think it gets tricky when we, if we feel someone is in the process of taking their life and it's like, then do we, you know, we, we might need to call 911 and do the best we can to um, assure their safety. But if we can, um, because, you know, that may not be something you can, you can't necessarily get yourself over to where they are and take them to a hospital and it may not even be appropriate to do so. So some things to think about. And there you can also specify, I've heard some people call and specify paramedics to come um, to a situation that they know, you know, and giving some more information about it and and have had some um, success with that. But a lot of things you bring up in that um, in that question. So thank you for that. Yeah, it truly was a multifaceted um, question as as we all are as individuals, the intersectionality of of, of race, um, of sexual orientation, as well as um, experiencing uh, a crisis um, and what that what that means for if you know, police were to show up for a welfare check. So thank you very much. Um, and somewhat related to that, we do have a couple of questions posed in the, the question uh, an answer uh, area that someone asked, but if someone is suicidal and I take them to the ER, will they be charged for the care? Well, unfortunately, I don't have a clear answer about that. You know, normally I would say that um, they're, they're not supposed to be. I mean, they're supposed to be covered by, um, there's a couple different things that hospitals have to cover that if it's not covered by their insurance. Um, so um, I think in that moment, if I'm at that level, I'm not thinking about that because of because I'm making the decision about this is this might save their life and money we can hopefully sort later. But they're you know, it's my understanding they're not supposed to be charged for that. Um, type of a visit. So, and, um, but I don't know if that is actually going to be true in every case because I don't, you know, I haven't heard whether someone has been charged. You know, most where I know a couple people, you know, clients that I know and other people when I worked in community mental health, they were not charged for it. But I can't speak for every location. I mean, I, I appreciate you giving your insight. Um, 
onto it. I know that it is very nebulous. It can be hard to to know exactly what will happen, and oftentimes it is kind of a case by case as to where where the person is being seen um, and all manner of things. So thank you. Um, and so uh, shifting a little bit, um, but are people who are thinking about suicide dangerous to others? Should I be worried about being in the same space as someone who is getting support for suicidal thoughts? I appreciate that um, question because, um, you know, but I think that, you know, and there are some times when obviously when we can hear, we can think about a number of these that we've probably heard about in the media, right, where there are people who are both suicidal and homicidal. That's not the usual, right? In most cases, someone who is suicidal is so exhausted psychologically and physically that um, they're really just focused on their own pain and themselves. You know, they're not in a rational place and they're not irrational to the sense of unless they're also homicidal and there's something else going on, um, like often in violence or trauma or abusive situations that may be that will increase the concern. Right. But in most cases, um, I would say they're the danger is to themselves in and, you know, but I think you'd have to I'd have to know the whole story right to be able to to say whether the person that you're thinking about or maybe you were thinking of something when you asked that question you know whether there is any concern i mean i think if i were concerned in any way like if then i would be making sure that you were also safe you know that you keep yourself safe as well and you know get them some support because to be um being suicidal at that level of where you're cons worried about them maybe being dangerous lets me know they're pretty high risk versus someone who is really um you know depressed and and feeling the pain of living and sort of immobilized by it which is what happens to a lot of people um and a lot of people who are suicidal actually don't even have the energy to make a suicide attempt but there are a lot of thought thinking about it and maybe even planning but it's um it's often exhausting to you know to even think about it so it's a i'd, I'd say that it depends on the situation but in general um i would say that the, the danger is mostly to themselves thank you and that such a such a hard and difficult conversation and question um, and I, I just know that the people that I have interacted with uh, in my own personal life who have um, had suicidal ideation um, that it's not about harming others but rather relieving of the pain as as you uh, said in your presentation um, earlier is that they're suffering suffering themselves um, and they're working to try and figure out the solution for that to alleviate so thank you. Um, and related to that, and a uh, couple a couple folks have uh, reached out to ask uh, this question, but um, a person I thought uh, was going to die by suicide is now not talking to me after I intervened, and now they won't talk to me. I worry they might try to take their own life again, but I can't check on them and don't know their close friends or family. What do I do? That um, that is a hard situation. You know, I know that that's something that um, people worry about sometimes. You know, that if I intervene, will they be mad at me? Will they not speak to me again? If I ask about suicide, um, what you know, what will happen? And and I think that um, you know sometimes this happens the situation that you're you're in it does happen and i think that um and it can be complicated because you don't sounds like you don't know anyone else in their life who who could intervene um you know i think that i would continue to to reach out in whatever way felt okay to you and i might just um 
I might just say, you know, just like the a caring message, right? That if if you're not if you're able to still text them or send an email or whatever contact information you have and it's in they'll accept it. Um, I would just say, you know, I might I say say some, something to them like I was I was really just concerned about your safety. I care about you. I know you don't want to talk to me, but I just want you to know I'm here if you ever do want to talk. And um, and then, you know, sometimes that's the most you can do, right? You did what you could. I remember one time when um, when I myself, uh, I was young, and this is, and you're just bringing this back to me, what a memory I have of when I was learning about um, suicide prevention in college with a um, field instructor of mine. And one of the things, somebody brought up this very same thing, and it was a friend, and he said that line that you may, some of you may have heard, you know, that um, a mad friend is better than a dead friend. And it was very blunt, you know, but it, at a, but I remembered it because I was thinking like, oh, yeah, I might be afraid to make someone mad, but if I don't say something, can I live with that? You know, so I always ask myself, you know, what can I live with? You know, is it okay? Can I have a, you know, a clear conscience that I've done what I could to help this person? And I, I also think if you're ever in a situation like this and you have a question like that, you can, again, you can call the suicide lifeline or the use the text line with these kinds of questions. And they're happy to, and they happy to offer some advice. They may even have some more creative ideas um, than I do because they're doing this 24 seven every day. But thank you for having the courage to ask to begin with. And I'm um, sorry that you're going through this right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that you uh, answered um, with an incredible line that uh, better better a mad friend than a dead friend. It is, it's extremely, um, uh, it is very direct, but it gets to the heart of like, do everything that you can um, and show that you care as much as you can and be as available. Then, um, and then it's ultimately not your choice to make, but the choices that you made, you can live with of I, I reached out, I was present, I did everything that I could, and, and and that's where I'm at. So thank you. I really appreciate you sharing that experience. Um, we have time for one final question before we wrap up. Um, and I'm going to, uh, I have one right here for you. Uh, I'm not suicidal, this person says, uh, but my parents are always asking and going through my stuff whenever I'm a little depressed. What do I do? How do I convince them that I'm okay? Um, yes, this is not another, e this is not easy either to answer, but, um, you know, I get that that can be pretty, pretty an invasive and annoying, right, to have them keep asking, and, and I wonder why they keep asking. That makes me wonder, like, is there something that you could say to them, you know, about how you're doing that would let them know that you're okay? Um, it might mean that maybe they could they might need some parent, um, some support, you know, for themselves to even learn that, um, you know, emotions go up and down, right? As humans, sometimes we get a little depressed and I don't know if you've been suicidal before and that's why they're so worried. Sometimes parents will worry more if you've expressed those thoughts in the past. But, and sometimes we just need to, you know, to need to remind parents that feelings go up and down, right? And we, we are depressed and sometimes sometimes that's just a part of life and it's okay. And we what's important is that we learn some skills to tolerate that and to regulate our own emotions. And um, sometimes parents need to know that that's, that's the case. But I probably need to know a little bit more about the whole story to know why they're why they are asking and maybe you know maybe if there's been a suicide in the community or in their family or there's lots of reasons why they could be a little bit more um like just really ups you know kind of 
what is the word I'm looking for, like hyper alert, you know, onto what's going on with you. So um, I think maybe some education that you could give them, you could share some some information about emotions and um, regulation. You could show them how you're getting support, how you're taking care of yourself, um, and that might be that might be helpful to them. I mean, communication and connection are probably the uh, the keys there. Yeah, thank you, and and thank you, um, um, whoever you are that. Uh, reached out and asked that question. It's a very powerful question and one that I think many people um, may experience. And it's when you're in that situation, it can be so hard to reach out uh, or to communicate um, like Charlene said. And uh, and so thank you. And we hope that uh, if you do find yourself um, in need of extra support, uh, we did post uh, many of the links um, uh, that that Charlene referenced in the uh, in the chat box um, that you could utilize to maybe get some support on walking through those kinds of conversations. Um, Charlene, uh, we are always grateful for you for uh, partnering with us and presenting with us as always um, and, and sharing your uh, expertise and insight. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you uh, so much. Thank you. If you're um, if you all who are joining us tonight uh, are interested in learning more about the incredibly impactful work that Forefront does or want to get more information and resources, please visit their website www.intheforefront.org, uh, which should be in the chat box or for those watching the recording in the description with this video. Uh, more information is on our website or in the follow up email uh, from this webinar. I do want to offer a Forefront's resource list that is a pretty comprehensive list for crises, uh, which you can get by emailing events at seattleymca.org. Thank you to everyone who was able to attend, and thank you to everyone for watching. If you are inspired by this work and want a behavioral health services accessible for everyone, please visit our, our website, www.seattleymca.org, to learn more about what we are doing and how you might be able to support the work in a way that is meaningful for you. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you uh, in the community. Take care.